Let's talk about Canada for a little bit, shall we? Let's talk about Canada. And uh, disclaimer, we're just going to get this out there, okay? So in Canada, on paper that we know of, we murder about 100,000 babies, preborn babies, each year in our country. Doctor-assisted murder, not made, right now is the fourth leading cause of death in Canada. And if you look at the graph, it's the percentage is increasing year over year, and the number's increasing year over year. We legislate and protect and pay for, with our tax dollars, the sterilization and the castration of boys and girls, and we call it health care. We call it gender-affirming care. The state openly steals from us in order to fund its many godless agendas. Bill C-4, which I'm sure you're familiar with because Pastor Steve has been faithful in preaching on biblical sexuality every year, is a piece of legislation that basically calls what we believe myth and says that if we try to call someone to turn from a life of sexual sin to obey God, that we could get in trouble and maybe go to jail for it. So that's law in Canada. Bill C-63 and Bill C-367, which are currently being debated in Parliament, will also legislate a kind of hate speech, which again, will get us in trouble simply for saying, this is how God has designed and defined marriage, sexuality, according to his word. Christianity in Canada is declining in both number and institutions, the number of churches, the number of professing Christians, that number has been decreasing steadily for the last number of years. Open hatred of Christians is normal and actually protected. Protected. There are bubble zones around libraries that engage in drag story hours where if you're within a certain distance, you can get in trouble for being there. There are certain cities that have adopted that kind of policy. Our economy seems to be heading toward complete collapse as we spend significantly more than we make as a country and roughly half of everything our country produces goes toward paying the debt that we have which is terribly irresponsible and cuts right against God's economic policy and the way that he has decreed that we should handle our finances. Our institutions, all of them, education, healthcare, business, media, entertainment, all of them have gone completely woke and have utterly abandoned any vestige of a Christian nation that we once had and have instead embraced a godless, satanic ideology for life and for flourishing. So I, would, I, I think it's fitting to use words like chaos, calamity, and devastation to describe the present state of our country. I don't think that's an exaggeration. I don't think that's hyperbolic. I think it's fair to say that Canada is in quite the mess, socially, economically, spiritually. It's in a bad place. Now, it's easy, even as I've listed some of those things off, maybe there are some of you that begin to feel the anxiety or the worry start to rise up. Yeah, Andrew, that's right. I'm worried about, worried about my job, worried about the financial stability of my family. I'm worried about the cost of proclaiming Christ and what it might mean in my workplace, losing my job. What if HR comes for me if I don't bow before the rainbow? So it's easy to hear all of that and to feel anxiety and worry start to well up within us. I can understand why we would grow anxious, why we might grow more into despair as we think about what's going on in our country. And this is why it is essential for us to ground our lives firmly upon the Word of God. That the foundation of God's Word, what He has revealed about Himself, about us, about creation, about life, about sin, about the end of things, this must be the foundation upon which we stand. Otherwise, we will get swept up, and we will be discouraged, and we will be afraid, and we will be anxious. We must trust in the eternal Lord, the true and living God, that his purposes are good, that he's very much in control, and that he will do what he said he will do. That in him alone, in him alone, will we find joy and peace and find the thing that our soul longs for when we are surrounded by calamity and by chaos. So Psalm 93, starting in verse 1. It's a short psalm. 
That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a short sermon. We'll find out. (laughs) Psalm 93, verse 1. The Lord reigns. Stop there. Let's stop there. The Lord reigns. Now, the psalmist is making a statement of present reality. The Lord reigns, period. This is a present reality. It's not as if he will reign at some point in the future. It hasn't happened yet. It's not as if he did reign at some point in the past. Now he's taken a little bit of a, little bit of a break off of his throne. The Lord reigns presently, fully. This is the state of God. And he reigns as king presently over what? Everything. The entire universe, including the little speck of dirt that we call earth. He is king over all of it. All of it finds itself underneath his sovereign rule as king of the universe. God is neither a petty tyrant seeking for more power, nor is he an impotent leader that can't get anything done because he just can't get parliament on his side to pass his legislation. This is not the God that we serve. He is king. He rules perfectly and supremely over all of creation. He's not grasping for power. He's not using his power in tyrannical fashion. He is a good king who reigns over everything he has made. That's just three words. The next bit of verse one. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. Let's stop there. He is robed, which is to say he is draped in. He is covered in. He is surrounded by what? Majesty, the psalmist says. So God, who is spirit, doesn't actually have a real robe that he's draped in. He's draped in majesty, power, might, strength. This is what he's covered in. This is what he's surrounded by. This is his garment. That this king who reigns is powerful and mighty and strong. He is beautiful. We, we, sometimes we have a hard time using that word. It's kind of icky. God's he's beautiful. The beauty of the Lord, the psalmist talks about, that I, would do, that I would see the beauty of the Lord and inquire of him in his temple. He's beautiful. He's praiseworthy. He is strong. He is glorious. This is the king who reigns over all of creation. The next bit of verse 1. He has put on strength as his belt. What does that mean? He has put on strength as his belt. The picture here is that this king is dressed for action. This king isn't one who just sits upon his throne and just kind of tells everyone what to do. Serve me. Go military. But the idea is that he's ready for action and he's fastening his belt. He's getting up and he's ready to go. He's ready for action to do what? To defend his people. To fight for his people. When there is a battle, the king doesn't say, okay, everyone go out in the army. No, the king rises from the throne. I will be out there. I will engage. I will defend my people. He isn't weak or feeble or limited because what he's, what he girds himself in is strength. He is strong. He is able. He is powerful. He is mighty, going to action for his people, not just sitting and watching them from a distance, but fastening his belt, ready to defend those in his kingdom. And the psalmist, I'm sure, as we can recall, powerful acts of God in history leading up to this point. They can think about the Lord with the Israelites in the desert, how he kept the land of Goshen safe from the plagues and how he led them out and how he parted the Red Sea. You can think about God providentially working through the judges that he continues to save his people even when they're in sin. David and his military conquests and the strength that he was able to operate in because of the Lord's strength. The psalmist has these in mind, I'm sure, when we think about the strength of God, the power of God, who actually fights for his people. That's what it means to say he has put on strength as his belt. He's ready for action. The last little bit of verse one. We're still in the first verse. Yes, 
the world is established, it shall never be moved. Now, there's a progression in this psalm. Because of who God is, because he is king who has reigned forever, because he is strong and glorious and beautiful and powerful and mighty, because strength is what he wraps himself in and girds himself in as he's ready to fight for and defend his people, because he is a great king, this is the foundation for this verse. Because this same God and king has created the universe that he reigns over as king. And the idea of the universe being established and never being moved speaks to the permanence of it and the care of it because it's this God who sustains it. This is the king who designed the universe, putting every star in place. This is the king who sustains this universe, who holds it together, as the writer of Hebrews would say, by the word of his power, the universe is held together. Mountains are immovable. Planets locked into orbit. Nothing will change. Nothing will shake outside of him establishing, maintaining, and controlling it. The universe will not be moved. He alone has power over creation. He commands creation. See, this is the paradox for those of us that let the, the, the scriptures speak true for themselves. Because even floods are not ones that happen that God says, Phew, I didn't see that happening. That really caught me off guard. I didn't anticipate that. I was hoping for a little bit of a dry day and the clouds form and I just had... That's nonsense. He, com he commands creation. Everything that happens in this universe happens because he sustains it and because he directs it. This is the king. This is the earth that is established by him. He is sovereign and he holds the world together. Verse 2. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. So, the question that we might ask is, how can we actually trust that God indeed is sovereign over creation? So how can we say when there are floods, when there are disasters, when the, world, the physical world seems to be in disarray, how can we believe that God indeed does rule over it? How do we know it's not outside of his control? Because it's not just creation that's established, but his throne is established from of old, and he is from everlasting. The sense in the Hebrew here is go back as far as you can, like all the way to the beginning of time, and then keep going. That's the sense in the Hebrew, that God has been king, his throne has been established as king before the world existed, which again is difficult to comprehend when God is outside of time. Before the world existed, God is king, reigning over all of it. So we can trust that he will hold the world together. We can trust that physical disasters are inside of his providential care because his throne also is established from of old. He has always been king and he will always be king. We're not waiting for him to be king at some point. He is king. He has always been king. And he will always be king, powerful, majestic, forever. Now, this first part of the psalm here is written to elicit these responses from us. To be confronted with the majesty of this God. So that we would consider that he is powerful, he is strong, he is sovereign, he is mighty, he is great. He holds the universe together. He is king from all eternity past into all eternity future. Upon his throne, robed in majesty, strength is his belt, ready for action, defending his people. We're supposed to see this God for who he is, and we're supposed to be rightly overwhelmed by the majesty of this king because we're going to see a turn in verse 3. And we're going to see this king now contrasted with physical creation. So verse 3 says this. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. 
The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. First, what we have here is a picture of creation growing more violent and more dangerous and life-threatening. We're supposed to see here in creation chaos and calamity, that it builds, it builds. We're also supposed to see here, if you note, the progression. Maybe, maybe you haven't noticed it. Maybe you've read through this psalm before and you just think he's saying the same thing. Yeah, the floods, the floods, the floods. But there's a progression in the language of the floods building. So first we see the floods have lifted up, O Lord. So he just sees them. Right? He just sees them. So in the distance. So you're, you're at the beach and the distance and you see far off, it looks like, looks like the waves are kind of building. It's really far away. You can barely see it. But then it says, the floods have lifted up their voice. Oh, now, now you can hear it. Now is the waters closer. Now I can hear the waves. I don't just see them. Now visually they're bigger at this point. But I can hear them because they're closer. And then the floods have lifted up the roaring. So now it's right on top of me. So now it's a flood. Now it's a wave that is so loud, so powerful, that the sound of it actually shakes me. If you've ever been... Like, I have these memories of being down by the rapids in Niagara Falls. And the water is so fast and so loud, you can't even hear yourself speak to someone else. The volume of it, it, it shakes you. You feel it. This is the progression in the psalm. Look at the water. You just see them in the distance. Not a big deal. Then they're closer and you kind of hear them. And then they're right on top of you. And the loudness of it shakes you to your core the thunderous sound about to crash down upon you, crushing you like an ant, if you're still standing there. If they've come to you at this point, when that water hits you, you're done. You're, you, are, you are almost an ant ready to be crushed by this water. So what is a person to do with this? So here we are, the floods are far away, I see them, they're closer, I hear them, now they're right on top of me. If you're in that situation and you've been standing watching the flood water build, what's a person do in that situation? Are you going to run? You can't outrun them. Are you going to fortify your house with what? You don't have the time or the materials to flood proof your house. When these waters build and they crash upon you, how can you survive the impending disaster? How will you be able to live through the devastation of the floods that have built and built and are roaring and the volume of it is shaking the core of you. We can't. You can't. In that moment, there is nothing you can do. The floods are so great and so loud and so close that you're done for. And the calamity and the chaos is so great that it's right on top of you. And the reason for it isn't necessarily because the floods themselves are infinitely powerful, because we're going to see they're not. The reason for it is because we are weak and feeble and limited. And water, which we like to drink cold on a hot day, enough of it would crush us into oblivion if it fell upon us. We're so finite. We're much more incapable than we think when we're confronted with the chaos of creation that as it rages can destroy us. We're supposed to see our smallness as the floods build up. That we're actually not in control as much as we think. We're not as powerful as we think. We're not as able as we think. The older we get, we realize we're actually not as strong or as healthy as we might think. My back can no longer sustain the kind of activity it could 20 years ago. The knees feel different. Why can't I do the thing I used to be able to do? We're confronted with it with age naturally, that we are a rather weak, feeble speck of creation. And we're supposed to see that. But it's not just us. It's not just confronted with our smallness. But this picture of the calamity building, of the intensity building, of what seemed to be once off on a distance is now right on top of us, I think is a pretty accurate picture of 
what's going on in our country right now as well. I think this is a fair assessment. I think that we can say reasonably that decades ago, you maybe have had people, Christians, saying, ooh, I see this, this thing in the distance is problematic. This legislation could be problematic. The redefining of marriage, this could become a real problem for us. You see the floods in the distance, and you say, if, if this builds and comes on us, it will be catastrophic. And then it builds, and then you start to see certain decisions. Ooh, this, this, person, this person got in trouble for preaching the gospel at a, at a sodomy parade downtown in Toronto. That's a, that didn't happen 10 years ago. We see now it's closer, now we hear it, now we're seeing as the flood approaches, the calamity is greater. And it feels almost as if we're in a place where now the waters are right on top of us. That our country is like this. It feels like being a Christian, it seems as if being a Christian means the flood waters are right on top of you. That faithfulness to Christ proves very costly. That calamity is around us in what we do to children in what's happening economically, in looking at the last four years, chaos and calamity has abounded in our country. But it's not, it's not just our country. Life also feels like this sometimes, separate from maybe national circumstances. Doesn't life feel like this sometimes? We think of our life and we think of circumstances around us, suffering or loss or pain or conflict, feels like we are standing on a beach and the waters are about to consume us. Doesn't it? If you've lived long enough, you know what I'm talking about. You look out at the waves ready to crash upon you and like a person who literally would be right in front of the waves, we say things like, how am I going to be able to get through this? Whatever this is. This is too much. It's too powerful. I'm not strong enough. I'm not, I can't handle this. I can't deal with this. I don't have the strength. This will ruin me. Maybe you've thought that. This is going to destroy me. This will ruin my life. This is the end of my life. Doesn't life feel like that sometimes? Like the waves are quite literally about to consume us and we are confronted with our helplessness and our weakness and our limits? Then we come to verse 4. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. This, this is our hope. This is our confession as God's people. As mighty and as life-threatening and as chaotic as the waves are. In our country, in my life, it doesn't matter. The Lord on high is mightier. He's more powerful than it. This is why the hymn writer could have said what we sang earlier. When darkness hides his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way. He then is all my hope and stay. This is the hope we have as Christians. This is what we believe to be true. As powerful as the waves are and the floods are, and they are, as mighty and as loud as they roar, threatening to undo us and destroy us and plunge us into even more chaos and calamity. The Lord, the King that the psalmist was clear to exalt in the first two verses, He is mightier. He is stronger. He is more powerful. Of course He is. He has been on His throne forever. So the flood water that rises up in an instant lasts for a few minutes. But this king has been upon his throne for all of eternity past and into all eternity future. Of course he's more powerful than the floods. Of course he's mightier than the roaring. He rules over the floods. 
They don't just happen. He commands them. He commands the wind and the rain and the storm and the lightning. He's totally sovereign over all of it. Nothing happens outside of his providential care. Nothing. He is mighty and he is powerful as king. So we don't have to fear the floods and the roaring. Or we don't have to fear anti-Christian legislation that seems to threaten our very livelihood and our well-being. We don't have to fear economic collapse and loss and say this is outside of God's ability to preserve his people. We don't have to fear evil leaders or evil agendas or godless policies or persecution or suffering. Why? Because mightier than Justin Trudeau, mightier than Doug Ford, mightier even than Klaus Schwab, who stepped down recently, but really he is in power behind the scenes, mightier than all of these petty, weak men who will be forgotten in several centuries, the Lord on high is mightier than all of them, king over all of them, ruling, yes, even over them. This is wonderful news for the hopeless, in despair soul, for those of us who presently are confronted with our weakness and with our limits, who find ourselves in chaos and calamity, whatever that is, this is glorious news for us. I'm not strong enough. Right. You're not strong enough. I'm not strong enough. We can't do it. We can't just overcome. We can't just be strong enough and capable enough. But the Lord is. He is mighty. Yeah, but he's not for me. Yes, he's for you. Because he's put on strength as his belt. Because he's not just sitting on his throne watching from a distance. But he's ready to put on strength as his belt and stand up and go to town for his people. He's ready to go to action for his people. To defend them to fight for them, to protect them, to provide for them. This is the king that, that we serve. This is the God who rules and reigns. Spurgeon said this regarding Psalm 93. This is a portion from a sermon he preached. Whatever opposition may arise, his throne is unmoved. He has reigned, does reign, and will reign forever and ever. Whatever turmoil and rebellion there may be beneath the clouds, the eternal king sits above all in supreme serenity. And everywhere he is really master, let his foes rage as they may. All things are ordered according to his eternal purposes, and his will is done. This is the king we serve. So then we come to verse 5. <clears throat> your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Since God reigns sovereignly as king over the entire universe, since he is mightier than all the disasters and all the chaos and all the calamity, when this God speaks and makes promises to us, we can trust him. We can believe him. We can take him at his word that he will do what he says he's going to do. Of course his decrees are trustworthy. He put the universe together. He holds it together. He is sovereignly powerful and mighty over every disaster. So when he says something... We can believe him. We can trust him. He's not lying, nor is he unable to fulfill his promises. We know that he has the power and the ability to fulfill his promises because he holds the whole universe together. And some might be thinking, okay, but how do I, how do I hear, Andrew? How do I hear? Is I'm waiting for a word from the Lord? Is he going to speak? No. If you want to hear what God would have to say to you. And pick up your Bible and read it. 
Oh, but I want to hear it audibly. Then read it out loud. And you will hear some sort of version of the audible voice of God as you read the scriptures. This is what he has given us in his mercy, his decrees, his laws, his commands. This is how he has chosen to reveal himself to us. And the writer of Hebrews tells us this. Peter tells us this in 2 Peter, that we understand that God spoke through the prophets, that God spoke through his son, that his son commissioned his apostles to record for us the New Testament. This is how God has spoken. Peter refers to the scriptures as a prophetic message, even more certain than having seen Christ raised, risen from the dead to Peter. The scriptures given by God is more certain and is more trustworthy. It is more foundational than even them who saw the risen Lord. This is how the scriptures elevate themselves. So when God promises something, you can believe him. Now, we have to figure out sometimes which of those promises are for us and which are not. So there's work to be done. Everyone loves Jeremiah 29, 11, except for the verses that come before, which are, you're going in exile, so be faithful. Oh, and you're going to be there for like 80 years. So everyone lets us zero in on verse 11. So we have to figure out how do we discern what the Lord has indeed promised us. What has he said he will do? But we can believe him. He is trustworthy. We also know that holiness befits his house. God is unlike us, different than us, set apart from us. He never sins. He never gets tired. He never makes a mistake. He's never lacking knowledge. He never does something and says, oh, I should have done that a little bit differently. No, he is totally, supremely holy. This is the king that we serve. And while his house is understood in this psalm to have been the temple, holiness befits your house, the temple where his spirit dwells, we know that God can't be contained in temples made by human hands. We know that Jesus said, yeah, that temple is going down, but a new temple will be raised up. And he was referring to the temple of his body. And then Paul says to the church, oh, and by the way, you local church, you are the temple where God does his work. And then in that same letter, he says, oh, by the way, individual believers, you are the temple where God's spirit dwells. So we just don't look at this and say, oh, it's only the temple that's now ruins. No, God exists and reigns everywhere. And in his church and in the lives of his believers, we see the holiness of God and the presence of God at work. He cannot be contained. Heaven is his throne. Earth is his footstool. The entire universe is full of the glory and the presence of the Lord. So we can definitely trust him. We can believe him when he says he's going to do something. He is eternally holy as he rules for all eternity. So what do we do? What do we do when chaos and calamity surround us? When disaster and evil are around us? What do we do? What are we to think? What are we to believe? And I don't want to gloss over suffering and pain and simply say, doesn't matter, just trust God, everything will be fine, just say the Lord reigns and it'll, it'll go away. I've lived long enough to know that's not how it works. So what are we to do? What are we to do when a family member is struck with a terminal illness and we know that they're going to die? And we know that it might be painful, it might not be, but we know that they're going to die soon. What do we do when we lose a child before they're born? Or I... I can't conceive. What do you do when we lose a job? And it's not just I lost a job. It's a job. It's provision for my family. What will happen to us economically? What will happen financially? What are we going to do? When there is legitimate conflict and separation, even within families, and there's now a, a clear schism between people, what do we do in all these situations when suffering is real? Right? This isn't just about the floodwaters in the distance. Oh, as long as I don't go to the beach, I'll be fine. As long as I don't live on the coast, the floods will never hit me. This is about more than the physical floods. 
This is about what happens in our life when chaos and suffering and calamity hit us. And friends, you know, sometimes when it hits us, it, it hits us. Sometimes the despair and the grief and the suffering and the pain and the loss are real and long. We know this. What do we do when it appears that persecution is not only growing, but will at some point be as commonplace as anything else? And that appears to be our lot as those who have united with Christ. What do we do as we anticipate the collapse, the further degradation of the systems and institutions in our country that won't look like lots of peace and lots of joy, but maybe the exact opposite of it? What are we to do? What do we do when it looks like evil is winning and the world hates us? What do we do when the floods lift up their roaring? The floods have lifted up their voice. Now the floods have lifted up their roaring. And it appears that it's right on top of us. What are we to do? Well, we are to remember that our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, reigns mighty over all of it. All of it. And he's even given us in his word a picture of Christ himself sovereign over the floods. In Mark chapter 4, after Jesus tells four parables about what the kingdom of God is like, then he shows his disciples what the kingdom of God is like by performing four miracles. And one of those miracles is Jesus on the boat, and the waves are building. It's evening on the Sea of Galilee. It's dark. It's dangerous. They're in the middle of the sea. The storm builds up. The disciples are freaking out. They wake Jesus up. Jesus, the boat's in the water, and the water's in the boat. We're going to die. Don't you care? Do something. Don't you, do you not care for us? Are you not able to do something? I'm sure we've, we've asked God those questions before. God, don't you care about me? Don't you love me? What about your promises? Can't you fix this? And Jesus stands up and rebukes the wind and the waves. Now, he didn't rebuke the wind and the waves by saying, Shh, hush, be still, stop, don't, don't, don't be so. He stands up, and with the same thunderous command that called Lazarus out of the grave, he says to the winds, silence! And it stops. This is our king. This is our king. So when the floods appear to be right on top of us, we remember that he is king even over the flood, that he commands the flood waters, that our entire lives are under his providential care. He is mightier than any disaster, any wicked man, any petty tyrant, any evil legislation. He's king over it, and he is holy, sinless, trustworthy. We can depend on him. We can rely on him. The Lord has never failed you. Never. Maybe it seems like it. Maybe in your weakness, you perceive it as such. But I know that in 24 years, since the Lord graciously called me out of darkness into light, in almost a quarter of a century, the Lord has never failed me. Never. Not once. Has it been an easy, bumpyless road? No. Does it mean that everything has gone according to my plans? No. Does it mean that suffering and loss have, has never touched my life? No. But God has never disappointed me. Never. And he will never disappoint his people. He will never fail to be king, ruling supremely over your lives. He will never fail you. He's never lacking the power or the ability. This is our king. You can bank on that. You can trust in him. He is mighty. He is powerful. Does it mean that the evil goes away and the calamity ends? Not necessarily. Maybe in his mercy it does. Maybe he heals in this life. Maybe he removes the calamity. Maybe he causes the floodwaters to subside. Maybe. Maybe not. 
it doesn't change the fact that he is good and holy and powerful and trustworthy and you can, you can rely on him. You can lean into him. He will take care of you. He will provide all that is needed for you to do what he's commanded you to do. And he will never fail his people. Doesn't mean it's smooth and easy. But he does reign. And you can trust him. You can trust that he is king over the entire universe. That the Lord on high, he is mighty. The Lord reigns. Thank you.